book of Jonah, of course, is a well-known book, uh, at least in the sense that most people have heard of the book of Jonah. But I want to say that the book of Jonah is not the story that you might think it is. It is not a children's story. It is not a story ultimately about a big fish or a whale. The book of Jonah is a story about rebellious people. The people who lived in the ancient city of Nineveh and were known all over the world for their wickedness, their violence, and their cruelty. In that sense, it is a story about all people in all places and at all times. The book of Jonah is also a story about a reluctant prophet who receives a call from God but runs in the other direction when God calls him. And in that sense, it is a story about us. As we read the book of Jonah, we are supposed to identify with Jonah. As a matter of fact, when the Israelites would read this book, and they would read it together aloud once a year, and as it was being read aloud on the Day of Atonement, all of the people would cry out together, we are Jonah. We are supposed to identify with this reluctant prophet. But mostly, the book of Jonah is a story about a relentless God who has a great heart for rebellious people and who does not give up on reluctant prophets. Now, this series is called Life Interrupted, and I've called this first message Life Interrupted. And what I mean by that title is that God interrupts our lives. The most famous evangelistic tract of all times begins with these words. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, I wouldn't dispute the truth of that, but I think it would probably be more accurate to say that God loves you and has a wonderfully disruptive plan for your life. Now, there's probably a reason nobody asks me to write evangelistic tracts. That might not play quite as well, but it is the truth. You see, when we hear God has a wonderful plan for my life, we think, of course he does. His plan for me is to have a good, steady source of income. His plan for me is that I would own a nice house, that I would would get married and have a happy marriage, that I would have some well-behaved kids, and maybe that I would have a vacation property that's kind of thrown in for good measure. Of course, God is, if he has a wonderful plan for my life, it's going to look something like that, right? Right? That's why most of our prayers can be reduced to requests for our safety, our security, our prosperity, and our health. Surely God's wonderful plan for my life includes those things. But it's interesting that when you read through the Gospels, you find that Jesus' call was actually a little bit different than that. For instance, in Matthew chapter 16, we read this. Then Jesus told his disciples... If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Denying ourselves, taking up our crosses, and following Christ is a good picture of what a life interrupted looks like. I want to jump into the book of Jonah this morning. We're going to read just the first three verses of chapter 1, and this is what it says. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of of the Lord. So would you just humor me this morning by saying we are Jonah. Awesome. Well, that's all we're going to cover this morning is those 3 verses, but there is actually more than enough here for us to think about this morning. The experience of God calling a prophet and issuing a call like this and spelling out his assignment is a fairly common feature of the prophetic books of the Bible. The technical name for this feature is known as a call narrative, and we actually learn quite a bit from this very brief call narrative. And the first thing we learn 
is that the call of God is a wonderfully disruptive thing. So the book of Jonah begins with these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now maybe the first thing we need to do in order to fully understand these verses is to answer the question, who was Jonah? Now, we're told here that he was the son of Amittai. And in and of itself, that does not mean a lot to us, but it does help us to identify this prophet Jonah as the same Jonah who we meet earlier in Israel's history. Back in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, we read about one of Jonah's earlier assignments from God, and this is what it says. It says, In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and he reigned 41 years, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He restored the border of Israel from Lebo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke by his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. So according to these verses, Jonah's earlier assignment was to go and preach to the nation of Israel that their borders would be expanded and restored to their original boundaries. Now, as far as prophetic assignments went in the Old Testament, that was a pretty good one. Preaching a message of prosperity to the nation of Israel was a lot easier than going to your sworn enemies in Nineveh and preaching there. So God's call to Jonah was disruptive. It interrupted his safe, and comfortable life in Israel. But the truth is that God's call is often disruptive. If you've read the Old Testament, then you know that it wasn't just Jonah who experienced a call like this or who responded like this to God's call. Maybe you could think for a moment about some of the characters that God called throughout history. Maybe you remember the story of Moses. Moses was basically minding his own business when God called him and said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and I want you to lead my people out of their slavery in Egypt. And when God calls Moses, Moses basically argues with him for two chapters in Exodus 3 and 4 about, God, you must have the wrong guy. And so in chapter 3, we, we read this. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is basically saying, look, I'm not qualified to do this. Go get someone else. But God reassures him that he will be with him. But again, Moses protests. And in chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. God then tells him that he will be given accompanying signs so that everyone will know that he is God's spokesperson. But again, Moses says, I don't want this assignment. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past since you have spoken to your servant, or either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. And Moses is saying, God, look, I'm not a great speaker. You need someone else for this job. Please, get someone else. God's disruptive call came also to the prophet Jeremiah. And God appointed him to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah res responded by saying this, Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. So Jeremiah's answer to God's call was, I'm too young for this, please get someone else. God's disruptive call came to the prophet Isaiah, and Isaiah responded by saying, and I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah basically says, look, God, I've got a foul mouth. Everyone around me does. Get someone else for this job. God's disruptive call came to the prophet Amos. 
Listen to Amos' dialogue with the priest Amaziah who was opposing him. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now, the background to that story is that Amos was a successful businessman in the land of Judah, and God called him and said, I want you to leave that, and I want you to go to Israel and to preach to them. But maybe most dramatic of all is the way that God called the prophet Hosea. And in Hosea chapter 1, we read this. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. I don't know about you, but that seems pretty disruptive to me. What I want to say is that the call of God is a wonderfully disruptive thing. And maybe you've experienced this. I know I've had firsthand experience with this, with the call to plant this church. And I identify with the calling of Jonah in that regard because I was in many ways reluctant to do so. There are a couple of fictional call stories that I identify with as well when I look at the calling to plant Crossridge. I've said to others that I feel somewhat like Bilbo Baggins. Now, in case you don't know, Bilbo Baggins is the lead character in J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Hobbit. The movie is coming out in December, in case you're interested. But I identify with Bilbo, not just because he was short. I identify with him because Bilbo Baggins was a hobbit, and hobbits were known for living Lives that were characterized by comfortable predictability. And the problems for Bilbo started when Gandalf the wizard showed up and invited him to leave his comfortable predictability, to leave the comfort of the Shire, and to set out on an adventure. And I won't summarize the entire plot for you, but Bilbo accepts the invitation and embarks on the adventure of a lifetime. And at the end of the story, after his adventures were finished, Bilbo Baggins returns to his shire. And on the final page of the book, we read that Bilbo had lost his reputation among the other hobbits. He was no longer quite respectable, but it says he did not mind. It tells us that he took to poetry and to visiting the elves, and the other hobbits just shook their heads at him, touched their foreheads, and said, poor old Baggins. And though few believed his tales, he remained very happy to the end of his days, and those days were extraordinarily long. Now, I haven't started writing poetry or visiting with the elves just yet, but I can identify with that story, and maybe you can too. I spent 13 years in ministry at Willingdon Church in Burnaby. It was my home church. Ilona and I both came to faith in Christ there. It was a great place to work, and I actually had a really good setup as a job. And I would describe those years of ministry as being very fruitful, but I would describe the last few years of my time there as comfortable predictability. And in many ways, I liked it just like that. I began to sense a call to plant a church in Surrey about five years ago, and initially, I was pretty reluctant and wanted no part of it. I didn't find a ship that was bound for Tarshish and take it, but I found my own way to avoid God's call. God would not relent on that, and so at one point I even met with a few of the elders, told them this is what I was sensing, and they basically said, that's great, Lee, but we'd actually like you to stay, and by the way, we will pay you more. Anytime more money is involved, it's usually an indication God is speaking, right? Right? So I stayed, took on more responsibilities, scheduled myself to begin doctoral studies, but God's call was relentless. And I'm glad I didn't have to get to the bottom of the ocean first, but God called me out of the shire and into the adventure of a lifetime. And there were plenty of people along the way who wondered if I'd lost my mind. Still many days I wonder if I have, but just like Bilbo, I really don't mind. God's call is disruptive, 
but it really is a wonderful thing. Now, I don't want to make this all about church planting, but I know I've talked to some of you who have said something similar. I mean, you had no plans on being part of something like this, but God called and here you are. Now, your experience with this might be different than mine. It might be different than that, the circumstances and the situation, and maybe the specific calling God has given you might be different. But make no mistake, if your experience with God's calling is just to sort of add Jesus to an already full life, you have to wonder if you've really responded to God's call. You see, it's doubtful that your agenda for your life and God's agenda for your life have been the same from the start. God's call is a wonderfully disruptive thing. Now, when I say that God interrupts our lives, I don't mean this in a negative way. The other fictional call story that I relate to is from the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And I know it's not Christmas time, but... As a family, we watch that every Christmas. The kids even now like to watch it with us, except for the kissing parts. It's a Wonderful Life tells the story of George Bailey, whose life is constantly interrupted. His dreams of traveling the world and making it big are interrupted again and again. First, by having to wait for his younger brother to graduate from college. Then, because his dad dies and he has to take over the family business. And then his own honeymoon is interrupted on the day he's about to leave because there's a run on the bank. And his wife, his four kids, and the dilapidated house he lives in provide a steady stream of interruptions in his life. To his imagined life. But in the end, George Bailey learns that all of those interruptions were actually God's way of saving his life and making it wonderful. And we will discover the same thing as it relates to God's call in our lives, that it will be disruptive, but it is the best thing we could imagine. Now, some of you may have never responded to God's call in your life, and you need to understand that it it will be disruptive, it will turn your world upside down, but it is the best thing possible. That Jesus is calling you into a relationship with him. Well, closely related to that first point is a a second one, and that is that we can easily think we are following God's call when we're not. So if if you had have gone to Jonah and asked him, Jonah, are you following God's call in your life? Before he got this call, I'm sure he would have said yes. I mean, after all, he was a successful prophet in Israel. And when God said, Jonah, go to the Israelites and tell them that their borders will be expanded and restored, he went obediently. It was only when God interrupted his life that a problem was revealed. Now, in fairness to Jonah, we need to remember that this was a very difficult assignment. Nineveh was not a nice place. God himself says here that their evil had literally come up before him or risen to him. And Nineveh had earned a reputation the world over for their excessive violence. They were basically the terrorists of their day. The prophet Nahum described the city of Nineveh like this. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder, no end to the prey. The crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel, galloping horses and bounding chariot, horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear, hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end, they stumble over the bodies. And archaeology confirms what the Bible says about the city of Nineveh. They were well known for their brutality and their cruelty. One of their rulers, Ashurbanipal, was accustomed to tearing the lips and the hands off of his victims. Another ruler, Tiglath-Pileser, would flay victims alive and then make great piles of their skulls as a sign to anyone who would dare to cross them. Sounds like a great place to go for a short-term missions project, doesn't it? And to understand Jonah's situation at the time, imagine the word of the Lord coming to a Jew who was living in New York City during World War II, telling him to go to Berlin and to preach to Nazi Germany. 
we probably wouldn't be very surprised if that person instead got on a plane and flew to California. Colin Smith puts it this way. When God interrupts your life, you may find that your comfort is more important and your obedience more conditional than you thought. See, in that way, Jonah is much like the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus starts listing the commandments. And as he listens to those commandments, he said, all these I have kept. And then Jesus says, well, then sell what you have, give it to the poor, and come follow me. And see, up until that point, the man was convinced. He's following God's commands. He's doing what God wants. But when Jesus puts his finger on the man's relationship to all that he has, it becomes clear he's got a God before God. And again, sometimes we can think we're following God when we're not. This is something I've learned as a parent. Your kids can sometimes have the appearance of being obedient when really they're just doing what they want. So the way it works in our house is generally, if I am making dinner, all I need to say is, kids, it's dinner time, and they will drop whatever they're doing, wash their hands, and rush to the table. That's probably your experience too, right? (laughs) Now, it does help that generally when I'm making dinner, it's some kind of dad food. I mean, it's pizza or hamburgers or hot dogs. Of course they're obedient for that stuff. Their obedience comes easily when it's something they already want. And the same thing is true in our lives. You see, if our obedience never moves past what we would already be inclined or predisposed to do, we're probably not quite as good at following as we might think. Sometimes we fool ourselves about that. The other way we can sometimes fool ourselves into thinking we are following God's call when we're not is by relying on past experiences in our lives. I mean, Jonah could look back on his past missions from God. But what really mattered was was how he was responding in the present to God's word. The old Scottish commentator, Sinclair Ferguson, put it this way, No past privilege, nor all past privileges together, no past obedience or fruitfulness in service can ever substitute for present obedience to the Word of God. So let me ask you, are you living only with the memories of obedience? Are you substituting your past spiritual record for present obedience to the Word of God? Or are you at a place where you joyfully welcome God's disruptive word in your life? I think a further thing we learned from Jonah here is that we can always find convenient escapes when we're seeking to escape God's call. Verse 3 says this, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to... <clears throat> sorry, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh. I'm reading in chapter 3, probably why it's not there. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. It says here that Jonah went down to Joppa, and when he got there, he found a ship bound for Tarshish. And the word that's used for found here is not the word that you would usually use if you wanted to convey the idea of finding something after you've made a diligent search for it. The idea conveyed by this word is found in the sense of stumbled upon or just happened to find. And the basic idea is that as Jonah came to the port of Joppa, he happened to find exactly what he was already looking for. Well, looky here what I found, a ship that is going as far away as possible from Nineveh. And I think what we learn from that, or what we're supposed to learn from that, is that we always have to be careful about taking circumstances or providences as sure signs that we are supposed to go in a certain direction. Charles Spurgeon once described a school friend who had a very violent temper, and he would often flare up with anger, and usually when he would flare up with anger, he would throw something. 
And what Spurgeon said is that what struck me forcibly was not that he got angry, nor that he threw something when he was angry, but that whenever he was angry, there was always something on hand to throw. You see, we can always find some bit of providential circumstance to justify what we're doing. When we have a heart to rebel against God, there will always be the means before us to do so. I know as a pastor, I've talked with individuals in the midst of an adulterous relationship who have said something like, well, you don't understand. The circumstances that brought us into this relationship couldn't possibly be coincidence. We have so much in common, and there are so many clear signs that we're supposed to be together. The truth is that we all have a tendency to rationalize our behavior in this way. And what I want to say is that there will always be a ship in the harbor to take you in the wrong direction. So don't confuse opportunity with the will of God. We need to move on. I want to highlight something else in these verses, namely that the call of God is found in the Word of God. Verse 1 begins by saying, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. And this is a common expression in the prophetic books. It occurs over 100 times. The essence of what it meant to be a prophet was that you had received a word from the Lord. And the word Jonah receives here is a pretty straightforward word. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. So Jonah's problem with this word wasn't that he didn't understand it. It was that he did. Now, I know we don't receive God's call in quite the same way Jonah did today. But our call is no less clear. I'm not saying that God doesn't sometimes speak to us through circumstances or through people or through the prompting of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But God's primary way of speaking to us and calling us is through His Word. And just like Jonah, our problem is usually not that we don't understand that word, but that we do. And what I want to say is that our call is not that different from Jonah's. Think about what Jonah was called to do. God said, I want you to arise, go to the city of Nineveh, a city that's hostile to me, and to preach my message there. It's actually a really interesting command when you stop to think about it, because if we could travel back in time, and we could go to the ancient city of Nineveh and travel around it a little bit in the 8th century B.C., we would see all sorts of problems in the city. I mean, we would see problems with the way they did sanitation. The city was filthy. A lot of disease was caused on the basis of that. We would see all of the problems with their medical system, ways that it could be improved based on our advances. We would see all the flaws in their education system and ways that could be changed. We would see a host of other social problems. And all of those things are important things, and they need to be addressed. But as God looks at the city of Nineveh, do you know what he thinks they need most? They need to hear and respond to his message. Now, is that how you see the world? As you look around you, Do you see the greatest need as the host of social problems or at the very core the spiritual problem that affects everyone? Now, we don't have a direct, or we do have a direct word from God about this. We have been given a call just like Jonah was. We get this crystal clear command from Jesus. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, I need to tell you up front that if you don't like the idea of being on mission for God... If you just kind of like the idea of coming to church, being part of a social club, then you will probably not like this series. Now, I'm not saying that you need to get a sandwich board and a megaphone and kind of walk up and down the streets of our city. What I am saying is that our call is not that different from Jonah's. 
we have been commissioned by God to take his message and to share it with the world. And if we are not doing that, we are no less disobedient than Jonah was. The call of God comes from the Word of God. The final thing I want to highlight is that the call of God is a reflection of the heart of God. Now, so far, we've just been focusing on our hearts and our response to God's call. But we don't just learn about our hearts here. We learn something about God's heart. And what we're supposed to learn from the book of Jonah is that our hearts should not be different from God's heart. Now, in these first three verses, we aren't given the full picture of God's heart for the people of Nineveh or for his prophet Jonah. But that will become increasingly clear as this story unfolds. But as just kind of a teaser of that with regard to Jonah, let me say that if all God cared about was getting the job done, he would have ditched Jonah and sent someone else to Nineveh. The repentance of the Ninevites that comes later is actually an amazing thing. But the salvation of the city receives surprisingly little attention in this book. Most of the attention is focused on God's work of salvation in the life of one disobedient, self-absorbed prophet. And we should see that as good news because we are Jonah. Now, I should probably give you a spoiler alert at this point because I, I do want to point out that we are given a very specific look at the heart of God with regards to the Ninevites in chapter 4. I want you to listen to the way the book of Jonah ends. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Now, in context, Jonah is upset because God has taken away this plant that was giving him shade from the sun. And God says, you didn't even make the vine, and you're upset about losing it? How do you think I feel when I look at all of the people who are made in my image, who are perishing all around you? Now, I think that's a good question for us to think about. So when you think about your neighbors and your family members, and your co-workers, and the thousands of people around you in our city who do not know their right hand from their left hand in the sense that they do not know God in relationship, do you have God's heart for them? Are you willing to have your life interrupted so they can come to know this God? That's the challenge we read about in the book of Jonah. Let's pray together. Father, as we think about this call you gave to Jonah and his reluctance to follow it, we can identify with it at many points. We thank you that you have love for us, that you are relentless in pursuing us, that you are calling us first to yourself and then to your mission, and we pray that we would respond in the right way. We pray that you would soften our hearts so that when we hear you speaking, we know it's for our good, and that when we hear you calling us to do something, we would do it with glad and joyful hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.